Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, 36, and 46. If you're using one of our Red Pew Bibles, it's page 1544. This scene in the Passion of Christ is an intimate, private prayer preserved by the Holy Spirit to teach us, among other things, about the humanity and the courage of Jesus and also a fundamental pattern of prayer. This pattern of prayer is not true for every prayer we pray, but it's true of the most desperate. And so closely does this prayer follow the pattern of the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Surely Jesus had the first prayer in mind when he prayed here. Here, as we celebrate the week before Easter, those days that Jesus and his disciples experienced leading up to Easter Sunday, we've talked about the triumphant entry, the cleansing of the temple. Last week, the busy day of controversy. And then there was that Wednesday of rest when nothing is recorded in the Gospels about Jesus and his disciples' activities. On Thursday, of the week before Easter, there was the Last Supper, which we will celebrate next week, and then the Garden of Gethsemane. And so, think with me about the flow of the story on this particular Thursday. We know that in the upper room, according to John's gospel, Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. And somewhere in that meal, Judas Iscariot is dismissed by Jesus to go and do the deed, to betray him into the hands of the Jewish authorities. Jesus, during this Passover observance, will institute the last Supper, the Lord's Supper. And he will also predict Peter's threefold denial of his Lord and his Savior. In this time period, in the upper room, during the Last Supper, there are many, many treasured teachings that we hold near and dear as believers. These treasured teachings include, I go to prepare a place for you. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Ask, and you shall receive. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. This is it. Jesus' entire life comes down to this point in time. This is why Jesus was born. This is the sum of everything Jesus taught. It's the ultimate reason for all of his healings and all of his miracles. His impending death, informed, deliberate, and voluntary. No one will understand the reason for his death until days after, and he will be completely alone. No, not one will stand with him. Even the Father will forsake him. And he is terrified. Let's read our text. Matthew chapter 26, in the Red Pew Bible, page 1544. Matthew 26, verse 36. 
Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Brother Burton Speckman, would you please come and ask a blessing on the reading of God's Word? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this church and this congregation. Uh, we just uh, pray for the blessing of this word and just pray that you will open our hearts to uh, carry this message throughout uh, the week and the months so that we can be uh, better living examples of you, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And we're going to move to slide number 10 now. Slide number 10, in the garden with Jesus. A time of great stress. Jesus was sorrow and sorrowful and troubled. One of the translators translate this, he was crushed with sorrow. The horrors of the crucifixion cannot be overstated. I'm going to address this more to the point next week. But Jesus' flesh will hang in strips after the beating not counting the crucifixion. And he will be overwhelmed to the point of death. Donald Hagner of Fuller Seminary says that the mystery of this agony cannot be fully penetrated. It's not just the horror of the crucifixion, this engine of torture that the Romans had adopted. But it was God's Son who, know, who knew no sin becoming sin for our sake. The perfect, blameless Lamb of God becoming the scapegoat. He was in need of prayer. He was in need of hours worth of prayer. Have you felt that burden? There have been those times when you were so overwhelmed with the stress of the moment, the decision that faced you, the news that you had received, the challenge ahead of you, that you just had to pray. He prayed. He prayed for hours. Can you do that? Can you pray for hours? I honestly don't know if it's in my constitution to pray for hours. Now, I can be in a spirit of prayer throughout the day, but honestly, to set aside in a quiet place hours in prayer? You know, this was no new thing to Jesus. 
he often prayed through the night. And here, in his greatest need, he prays for hours. And when you follow Jesus here in the garden, and you see the progression of his prayer, you can see how God blessed and answered the need of his heart as he went forward. In uh, verse 39, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. God, if there is any way I can get around this, I would rather get around it, all right? If it's possible, and, and mind you, he's talking to the creator of the universe, the most powerful being there ever was. God, if it is possible for this to pass away from me and me not drink this cup, that's what I want, all right? And then after an hour or more of prayer, in verse 42, if it is not possible, then your will be done. Jesus has moved from praying that God would remove this from him to the place where he can say, okay, I see that it can't. It's not possible, is it? In this exchange between Jesus and the Father, he had this growing conviction that what lay before him was unavoidable. And so, if it is not possible, then your will be done. Then you do what needs to be done. And I'll do what I need to do. And so, in victory, having the determination of what God wants... He finds victory. I don't think Jesus triumphed at the cross. Jesus triumphed in the garden. He didn't win the victory as he suffered and bled for us. He won the victory before he ever got there. His faith was resolute. His decision was made. He was confident in what God wanted him to do. And armed with that confidence... He set his face not only towards Jerusalem, but he set his face towards the cross and he accomplished what God had for him to do. Sometimes prayer is like that. Sometimes we wrestle with God and we say, Father, if there's some way you can change this, if you can change the doctor's diagnosis, if you can help me escape where I am, if there is any way out, that's what I want. And sometimes through prayer, we come to an understanding. You know what? God's path and my path, they're not the same right now. God's plan for me is not to pass this by, but to go through it. And so, Father... Not my will, but yours. There's an understanding that comes of this with time and maturity. For those of us who've lived just a little bit longer than some of the youngsters, we understand better what Jesus experienced in the garden. But let me say again, it was prayer that enabled Jesus to go through what the Father wanted him to go through. It was prayer. And what was the disciples' experience in the garden? Well, somewhat different than Jesus. Do you still have your Bibles open to Matthew 26? They had the best of intentions. Up in verse 35, Peter says, even if I have to die with you, I'll never disown you. Faithful to the end. Yeah, right? And lest we single Peter out, and all the other disciples said the same. Convinced they would be completely faithful. Jesus asked for their help. Sit here. Sit here while I go over there 
and pray. Verse 37, he takes his two closest, excuse me, his three closest friends, and he draws them farther into the garden, and he asks them to watch, to be alert. You know, there is real physical danger here. Judas the betrayer is is a short distance away, reading a mob with swords and staves and torches. Someone needs to keep watch. Someone needs to watch the flanks. Someone needs to be alert to danger. But there's also this urgency of spiritual need. Throughout the rest of the New Testament, the idea of watching and praying is a byword among the disciples. He wants them to watch. He wants them to pray. And in verse 41, he says, pray that you don't enter into temptation. He's already predicted what will happen with Peter and his denials. He already knows that the sheep will be scattered as one without a shepherd. And he says, pray for yourselves. Pray for yourselves. But they couldn't stay awake. Now, someone this week asked me, I don't remember who it was, they said, Brother Steve, you, you see everyone's faces, don't you? They said, you know, I bet there are some times when, when people kind of nod off in church. That is absolutely true, all right? You remember how, how the, the, the pilgrims, they had someone sitting at the back with a long pole, like a, a cane pole with a rabbit foot on the end. They could thump you. And they had a feather that could tickle your nose, you know? Of course, worship services lasted two or three or four hours, so it was really a strain sometimes. And I know that oftentimes you've got little babies at home that keep you awake, or you're like me, you're a senior adult, and you don't sleep so well, and sometimes you just can't prop your eyes open. I get that. I understand that. Two things. My messages really aren't that exciting. And sometimes it might be better for you to get rest. It's true. I can can live with those realities. They're true. That's not what this is about. This is a desperate hour. This is a crisis. These men need to stay away. Are there times when you've been caught spiritually napping? Not physically drowsy, but you missed an opportunity that came before you. There was a time when you could have said something, when you could have spoken up or you could have done something, and after that moment was passed, when it was already gone by, you thought, oh, no. Why didn't I say something? Why didn't I do what the Spirit was speaking to me to do? I have missed an opportunity. And you know what? When they're gone, they're gone. They're just missed. Jesus urges his disciples to watch. Because this is the time when either good things are going to happen or bad things are going to happen. Sometimes that still, small voice of the Spirit whispers in our heart and we have an opportunity to do the right thing. So when you're in the garden, stay awake. Now, You can't stay awake all the time. We need our six, seven, eight, or nine hours, don't we? But when you're in the garden, when you know it's important, when you sense the tempter's presence, stay awake. Don't let those moments slip by. Watch. Pray. Pray with persistent determination.
when you're in great stress, when you're making a difficult and important decision, when no one understands what's really at stake besides you and God, pray. Don't be hesitant to tell God what you want. God, this is how I want things to work out. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Pray for God's will. And drink the cup of self-sacrifice. Whatever garden you are in, whatever trial stands before you, you know it's really not about you. It's really not about what's best for you or would make you happiest. When you sign up with Jesus, it's all, it's all about the kingdom. It's the Father's will that counts. And whatever trials face you after Gethsemane, victory starts in the garden with Jesus. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, the task is greater than we are. The challenge is bigger than our hearts. Our fears can rise up in front of us and reduce us to terror and tears. But in you we can find strength. In you we can see our courage. As we pray, as we watch, as we seek to avoid temptation, in you we can be strengthened, and you can give us the victory. So arm us for the valley of the shadow of death. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.